Emma is cooking. What are you cooking today? Um, toad in the hole. Toad in the hole is one of my favourites. Now we've got some sweet shops, a trolley. That's our stool. service this morning. It's great to have you with us. For a thousand years, Christians have been beginning their morning worship with the opening verses of Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. And we're going to do just that now as we sing our first song. All creatures of our God and King.
Psalm 95 also contains these words. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And we know that many times over the last week, we've been hardening our hearts towards God and his love. So now is our opportunity to confess those sins before him in the full assurance that he forgives us all our sins. So let's pray our confession together now. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear these words from Psalm 130. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. How wonderful it is to know that we are completely forgiven because of what the Lord Jesus did on the cross. And so, before we hear Andrew read God's word to us, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you do not keep a record of sins, that you, with you there is complete forgiveness because of what the Lord Jesus did for us on the cross. Please may we delight in our salvation and please pour your Holy Spirit into our hearts, Lord, that we may hear your word and that we may love you more deeply as a result of hearing it this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully, and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Reading from 1 Peter 2 and verses 4 to 10. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now, you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Thanks be to God for his word of truth. So age 16, the plan was to be an airline pilot. And uh, in many respects, that set the direction of what I wanted to do and what I needed to do in order to get there. So I needed sponsorship, which meant that I needed to get uh, the right degree, which meant the right A-levels. Uh, and so it, it, it set everything in motion. I knew what I wanted to be and therefore how I was going to be. 
And the world, I suppose, is constantly trying to answer that question, who am I and how should I be? I mean, as you can see, clearly that didn't work out, the whole airline thing. I, I kind of changed my mind. But when you know who you are and what do you want to be, we then know how to act and how to live our lives. It's true of nations uh, when they started out to, who are we? Well, what do we do? What do we stand for? What does it mean to be a citizen of this country? And that is basically the challenge that Israel have in Exodus 19 and following. Uh, who are we? How should we be? How should we live? And so who are they? Well, they are, in verse 5, God says, if you obey me fully and keep my commandment, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That they're to be God's treasured possession. Now, being a treasured possession speaks of being royal property. Now, note verse 5, the whole earth is God's. The whole earth is God's, but it's his joy and it's his pleasure that the people of Israel will be his treasured possession. It's the most special of people. Now, I think of um, all the houses that Anna and I have lived in uh, since we've been married, as we've moved around, and we've taken all sorts of bits and pieces with us uh, that are now in the vicarage here in Burford. And yet there are some things that if the vicarage was now on fire, I would run to to go and get. They are our treasured possession. And it's as if God's saying, the whole earth is mine, but you are, you are what I would grab. In fact, they are exactly the ones he did grab out of Egypt. But why is it he grabbed them? Was it because they were more numerous? No, it is because, we read in Deuteronomy, because the Lord loved them. And because the Lord kept his oath, his promise to, his, to their ancestors. You see, they are his treasure possession because he loves them, because he set his love on them, not because of anything they've done, but because they are his precious possession. Uh, treasured um, possession, uh, but also they are to be a kingdom of priests. Now, now the priesthood hasn't yet actually been inaugurated in um, Israel. That, that's going to come in the chapters to come in the book of Exodus. Uh, but in some respects, they didn't know what a priest was. they have been surrounded by them. A priest is someone who speaks from God to the people and from the people back to God. And so as a people, they are going to do that. As a nation, they're supposed to represent God to the world. But not only a kingdom of priests, but also a holy nation. And this tells them how to live, I suppose. Because the word holy means separate, distinct, different. They are a nation, therefore, that are supposed to be clearly his, identifiably his, obviously and identifiably like him. But notice that this separation cannot mean isolation, because they're supposed to be priests. You can't be a priest and have no interaction with the people you're supposed to be representing to. So they're supposed to be separate, yes, like God, yes, but in the world. And so this teaches us, therefore, that the character of the people of God is to be like God, but they also have an international responsibility as they represent God to the world, priests to the world. Now, how is it that they can do this, that they can be like this? Well, it is because, verse 4, you've seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. It is because they're gods. How are they gods? Because God rescued them. That is the most important thing that we need to remember here, that because God rescued them, they can now be this holy nation, this kingdom of priests. They are his treasured possession. That they were rescued on that first Passover, when God came in judgment, because the blood was on the doorposts, the blood of the Lamb, they were spared the judgment and they left Egypt and were set free. When we looked at Exodus 12, we saw how that Lamb prefigured the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. How Jesus Christ rescues his people. How do people become the treasured possession of God? Through faith in Jesus Christ. Would you 
love to be God's treasured possession? They need to be rescued by Jesus Christ. Have you been rescued by Jesus? But also, do you want to represent God to the world? Do you want to be like him? It's only possible if you are one of his people, if you have been rescued by him. And the second reading that we had from 1 Peter 2, uh, the point that Peter is making is that all the amazing promises of God uh, to Israel, the responsibilities they had, supremely are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And then are specifically to be carried out by Christ's people. And so as we, as a church, begin to work out what the new normal is going to be like for church life, what is the church supposed to be? What are we supposed to do? Well, Peter says, we are the new Israel of God. We are the rescued ones by Jesus Christ. We are to be kingdom of priests, holy nation. That is, we're supposed to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. And so that means there's going to be a great importance of holy living. But why? Why? Because as Peter says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Uh, the way in which we live should uh, be an advert to the world that they want to be saved and be one of God's people themselves. Uh, holy people declare God to the world by their works. But the kingdom of priests declare God to the world by their words, works and words to the world. That is the primary role of the church. And so yes, the Burford Benefits is here to love the community, and we're here to care, to provide services, uh, to be a listening ear, to be a positive influence in society, and we must do all those things. But how do we do that? Supremely it is by our words and our works. Supremely, the church is made up of those who have been saved by Jesus Christ, who are priests called to declare God's words, and a holy people to make God's ways and his works clear too. So who am I? What should I be? What's my purpose? Well, if I'm saved by the Lamb, I'm his treasured possession. Who we are priests to declare God's words to the world and we're to be holy to be separate to be different and declare God's word to declare who God is by our works and when we see who he's called us to be well we ought to respond in worship and in wonder and so let us do that as we sing now
So before we move on, I want us to take a close look at verse 5 again, because verse 5 seems to be um, uh, conditional. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my commands, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. It seems like they can only be the treasured possession if they obey. And that leads people to begin to believe that uh, maybe uh, God's people could only be God's people if they obeyed. Well, to help us, let's go back to Exodus 3. Uh, Exodus 3 was where God met Moses in the burning bush. And uh, he told Moses, go and rescue my people. And Moses had all sorts of reasons why he thought he was the wrong guy. But God said this, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I that have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So why are they here? Well, it is evidence of the fact that God is the one who's rescued them. Here are all of Israel gathered around this mountain. It is a fulfillment of God's promise. But also why are they here? They're here to worship God. They've been saved from Egypt, but saved to worship. At Romans 12, we'll pick up that same idea in the New Testament. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, so in view of the rescue you've had of chapters 1 to 11 of, of Romans, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your true and proper worship. Save from sin to worship God. Now, of course, worship is uh, bowing low, submitting oneself, but actually, how is this worship expressed? Well, in Romans 12 to the end of the book, a series of instructions and, and ways to live your life. How is this worship expressed in the book of Exodus? Well, they've been rescued, they're at the mountain, and then we get in chapter 20 and following the Ten Commandments, the law. But what this tells us is that worship is defined and seen in obedience. Obedience to what? Well, in obedience of being like God. This law is an expression of who God is, of being wholly separate and distinct. And so, uh, in chapter 19, verse 4, uh, God says, I've saved you, uh, I've carried you on eagles' wings, and so be the holy nation that you're called to be, be the kingdom of priests, live those lives that you're called to. That is, when they're saved, they're supposed to be the kingdom of priests and a holy nation, because that is what worship is. And that's only truly seen when they obey him. Obedience is the way into the blessings of the covenant of God. So I hope you see how the Old and New Testament speak with the same voice. Saved from something to worship God. So when you look at the commandments in the Old Testament, uh, that is not the Old Testament way to be saved. It is the way for all believers to worship God, to live in the light of the fact that we have been saved. Uh, and so what does this obedience look like? Uh, how do we live uh, these holy lives uh, as a holy nation? Uh, how do we do that? Well, we have these Ten Commandments. And we see that um, uh, the Ten Commandments uh, begin, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no gods before me. The point is clear. I've rescued you, so now this is how you ought to live. So the law is not a ladder to climb to God, but it's a pattern of worship of God. It's not the way into God's good books, but it is the way to live because you're in God's good books. The first four commandments are about how we relate to God. The next six are how we relate to people. And then from that point on, uh, the other laws are sort of very itemized and applied into all sorts of small parts of life. Why? Because to worship God is not just a Sunday activity. All that we are, all that we do, is worship our whole lives to be given over to God. So very briefly, let's have a look at these uh, Ten Commandments. And when I say briefly, I've got about five minutes to do all ten. And the first uh, one is about loving God with all our heart. You shall have no other gods before 
me. That is God first, nothing and no one above or in the place of him. How might we break it? I suppose there are times, aren't there, when we think, if only I had that. Or if I didn't have that, then life would cease to be worth living. All you need to remember is that God is the greatest and most supreme and most glorious thing in all of, in all of existence. And so to put something before him is the very opposite of worship. He's the one that's rescued. He's the one that loves. He's the one who's made us his treasured possession. And so put nothing before him. The second commandment, make no image of God. That is, be careful that you don't think of God as something that he's not. We'll see an example of that next week when we get to Exodus 32 and the golden calf. But we so very easily do it when we think of God only in ways that, well, we form him. So, for example, we might say he is a God of love and almost keep it only to that. So, therefore, any form of um, uh, way of life, we, we, can, we can live however we like because, well, God is a God of love. So, so he'll just forgive. That's his job. Or, or the other end, we can be so committed to God's holiness that we can become quite judgmental and be pretty unkind to people when God is actually God of love and grace and mercy. So one of the things uh, we need to be careful of is that we think of God truly of who he is. Commandment three is about the name of the Lord and therefore how we speak and represent God. Of course names are a one word um, sort of shorthand and description of who someone is of their whole character. And so we've got to be careful. If we're to be the kingdom of priests, uh, declaring God to the world, then we've got to be careful about how we speak about him. Four is about the Sabbath. Trusting God to provide and to enjoy him. The, the whole goal and aim of being saved is that we can worship him, and know him, love him. And so that fourth commandment is, is about enjoying him. Now, number five is about parents, and we're just going to pause on this one for a minute, because as Ephesians 5 says, this is the first command with a promise. Uh, and uh, what we also see is that actually this number five uh, reflects how we relate to God and how we relate to people. How is it that children first learn to obey God? How is it that children first begin to know what it means to live under the authority of God? Well, it's expressed in the way in which they honour their parents. From the earliest of ages, right through. It, yes, it adapts and it changes as we get older, but how we obey and honour our parents reflects how we'll learn to obey and honour our Heavenly Father. But it's also true on the social level, uh, sort of our loving our neighbour level. Uh, that is, if we want to uh, learn and understand uh, how people are going to relate to society, we'll see it in how they love and care and honour their parents. What is our prior social responsibility before we relate to the world? It is how we honour and respect and love our parents. Remember, uh, these are commands uh, that demonstrate the holiness of of God. And so number six then goes on to talk about the fact that we shouldn't kill. Or, or as Jesus will expand and explain and develop in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we shouldn't even be angry uh, with people. Because God is a God who gives life, so don't go taking life. Or, or seven, uh, we see that God is holy and that he is a faithful God and therefore don't commit adultery. In 8, we see that God is a God who gives, who delights to give, and therefore don't go taking and stealing. Commandment 9, God is a, is a God of faithfulness and, and truthfulness, so, so don't lie. 10, God is a God who is generous, and so don't covet and don't be envious. God is always thinking of others. And so that is what it looks like and what it means to be a holy people, living as a holy nation, 
and as a kingdom of priests, saved from sin to worship God. So who are we? Who are you? Are you someone that trusts in Jesus Christ? Are you one of his saved people? Then let us worship him. And how do we worship him? We worship him as we are the priests that we're meant to be, declaring his words to the world. And be the holy nation that we've been called to be, live in his ways. How? Well, as Jesus summed it up, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul and strength, and love your neighbour as yourself. That is our true and proper worship. Let's pray. Let us come before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the privilege we have of meeting together this morning. We thank you that we are able to do so in safety. Although many of us are physically separated from one another, we thank you that in Christ we are nonetheless members of your body, the true church. Although physical separation may be hard for us to bear, we thank you that we can look forward to the great day when we will all be united together before your throne and never separated from your presence again. Gracious Father, we're so sorry for the ways that we have sinned against you and against each other. We're sorry for the times we have got angry with other people. We're sorry for the times we have blamed others for things without realising how much is wrong with us. We're sorry for the times we've been selfish and have not been willing to share with others. We're sorry for the words we have spoken which have hurt other people. We thank you, Father, that because Jesus died for our sins and was returned to life, we can be forgiven for our sins when we say sorry to you. We thank you that in Christ alone you restore us and give us your spirit to help us live lives that please you. Father, we thank and praise you that we have been able to take tentative steps towards the resumption of gathered services on Sundays. We pray that our experiment of holding a service in Burford this morning might be successful. We pray that it might teach us what we can safely do. And ultimately we pray that it might enable us to reopen our other churches in the benefice for the good of those around them. We pray for all those in the decision-making process, Tom, our vicar, Oliver, all the other clergy, the PCCs and the church wardens, and we ask that you might equip them by your spirit for the decisions they will need to take. Turning to pray for individuals within our family, we remember before you, Father, those from our number in particular need at this time. You know their situation far better than we do, so we ask that you will be at work to bring about your good purposes in their lives. In a moment of quiet, let us pray to our Father for those known to us personally who are in need. turning from the individual needs of our church family, we pray for the ministry teams who will be taking the next weeks to begin to plan activities and programmes for the remainder of the year. We pray for Tom Wilding, our new youth worker, joining the team tomorrow. We pray that he might settle in well over the summer and begin to be able to make preparations for September. We pray for all our clergy and other ministry staff and pray that you might give them rest while they take some leave during August. We pray that you might restore and re-energise them and bring them back refreshed, ready to serve you in the autumn term. Turning from the needs of our church family, we pray for our local community, our friends, our neighbours, family, indeed all those who have been affected by COVID-19. Father, we pray that you might be at work in and through each one of us to bring compassion, mercy and consolation to those who need it. 
We pray too at this challenging time of transitioning out of the lockdown. We pray for all those schools, community facilities and local businesses who are having to make decisions about what they can and can't do. Father, we ask that you might continue to have mercy upon our community and keep people safe. We ask, Father, that you might increasingly give us the courage and boldness to proclaim the great news of Jesus Christ and him crucified to those around us, to point people to the only source of genuine and lasting healing. As your word commands us, we pray for our Queen, her ministers and government, parliamentarians and all those in authority over us. In the midst of so many challenges that will affect the future of all citizens of this nation for many years to come, we pray that you might use our government's policies to improve well-being and promote peace. Peace between nations, peace between communities and peace within families. We pray that our government might safeguard our freedom to obey your laws and live as you tell us to. And Father, we must ask that we might make good use of those freedoms. We close our intercessions with the words that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Philippi. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you, James, for those prayers. And now, as God's rescued and redeemed people, let's sing our final song, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Thanksgiving and a blessing. 
Lord, we praise you that we are your chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to you. Help us, Lord, to declare the praises of you who called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.